Okay, so on our journey to finally figure out what the exact area is under a curve, we're going to eventually get into using sigma notation in order to add up a bunch of rectangles underneath an interval. So before we jump into all that, we first need to start with the basics and know what sigma notation is. So here's a symbol, kind of looks like a giant letter E. The letter down below that could change, it could be I, it could be a J. So we start with one number and it goes up to another number at the top and that tells you how many of these that you're adding together. The summation here, that's called summation notation, is technically what this is. That means you're adding a bunch of things together. So with this you have A and then that's the subscript I. That means that you're putting a 1 in for I, a 2 in for I, and a 3 in for I and so forth. You keep doing that all the way up until you reach whatever N is. So let's do that with this example here. We want to evaluate this. So these are going to have only one number as an answer. It's going to be a sum of different terms. So for this one, we're starting i out at 1. So what we do is we first say i is equal to 1. And you're going to put 1 into whatever expression that you see afterwards. So we're going to do 3 times 1 minus 2. That's going to equal 1. Next, we're going to let i equal 2. So 3 times 2 minus 2. We do that we get a 4. Keep on going. Keep on going until you reach 4. 4 will be your last term that you'll put in. So 3 times 3 minus 2 is 7. i equals 4. 3 times 4 minus 2, we get 10. So we get all these individual terms by changing the i, and then what you're going to do is you're going to add, add all that together. So the final answer that you're going to have here is going to be the sum of adding all this together here. So it's going to be 17, 18 plus 4 is 22, so 22 is your answer. So now let's take a look at another example involving trig. Okay, for the next one, we have a K down here instead of an I. So again, these could be used interchangeably. Some books have I, some have K, doesn't really matter. It just tells you what variable you're using in the expression itself. Now this one is another one I want to start out with k equal to 1. I'm going to put 1 into every place you see a k on this one. So I have negative 1 to the 1 and then cosine of 1 times pi and then I just want to evaluate that. So negative 1 to the 1 gives you a negative and then you have cosine of pi that's negative 1 from your unit circle and so your first answer is going to be positive 1. Next, you let k equal 2 negative 2 squared, and you have cosine of 2 pi. Now negative 1 squared is positive, so we get a positive 1, and then cosine of 2 pi, that's also positive 1, so we get 1 as our answer there. k is equal to 3, we have negative 1 cubed, and then cosine of 3 pi, Negative to an odd power means you have a negative, so we have a negative 1 there. And then times, for this, cosine of 3 pi, if we subtract 2 pi from that, we're left with a cosine pi. We know that's going to be negative 1 again, so we get positive 1 once again. Then finally, k is equal to 4, and we have negative 1 to the 4th power, cosine of 4 pi. So negative number to an even power is positive 1. This is always, this will be positive here because you can subtract 2 pi from it, so cosine 2 pi is also positive 1, so you get 1. So it seems like every single time we do this, we're always getting 1. Notice that whenever we have this part right here, a negative 1 raised to a k, if we had that part only, we just have alternating signs. They go positive, negative, positive, negative. So this is basically a way you can get an alternating sequence by having something like that. But because we have a cosine next to it, it kind of cancels out any negatives because it's always opposite every time. And so now all we're going to do is uh, add this together. That means that our final answer is going to be 4.